Thanks, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with automating WordPress development. Slides are already online, so if you want to follow along, it's, it, it, there's not a lot of code in these. It's mostly links, so it's not something you probably need to follow along with, but feel free to if you need to, if you'd like to. So as, as Bill was saying, my name is Chris Wigman. I'm a senior software engineer at WP Engine, where I'm working on local development tools, so helping developers automate their tools, quite honestly. I was, I, at one point, I built Better WP Security, which is now iTheme Security and owned by Liquid Web. I had sold it back to them about six years ago. I've taught computer science at St. Edwards University. I speak on privacy everywhere from WordCamp Utrecht, those WordCamps in San Diego. I, uh, I'm actually an ex-airline captain and do a lot of work with history. So I've been around this WordPress stuff from a whole lot of different angles, mostly education with a little bit of aviation sprinkled in and a whole lot of security and privacy, but a lot of enterprise type work in those types of uh, environments, which brings me a lot of this automation stuff. As we get going, one thing to, to keep in mind with WordPress, automation is good so long as you know exactly where to put the machine. And WordPress kind of exemplifies this. There's a lot of machines going in WordPress from the time we download the site to when we're developing what we're, whatever we're working on, to testing that project locally, debugging that project, stakeholder review, and deploying the project. That's a whole lot of places to, that we could possibly put these machines or these, these processes to help us automate what we're doing in WordPress. This talk's gonna focus very heavily on the plugin side of things, but everything should be applicable if you're building a theme or a site as well. To zoom in on some of this a little bit more, let's, let's start with the, the first machine location, downloading existing work. Probably looks something like this, your workflow. Set up a local server, log into your remote server, copy files, log in the database. Maybe you have a plugin that you've already automated some of this. Maybe you have a backup buddy or Migrate DB Pro that automates your database transfer for you. If not, maybe you have something like Navicat, which is a great database tool where you can drag and drop your database from one server to another. But you probably already have automated some of these steps here. But these are very common steps and we're still doing, if you work on a WordPress site, you're doing some function of these, some function of this workflow, some version of this workflow already. How many folks have automated at least part of this? Okay, about a quarter of the room. It, it, it's the easiest, it's probably the most traditional, and most of our tools kind of do this for us by default. For instance, if you want to copy the files to copy a modern site, the easiest way to do this is to use a modern tool. Local by flywheels, by far the most popular. At the end of the month, I get to finally say this, where we're WP Engine's launching DevKit, which will be our own tool, which will allow you to clone, copy, do all the automation itself. Both of these tools allow you to basically press a button or run a command in your terminal, take the whole site, update your database, does everything for you. Now, if you're not with local, or if you're not with Flywheel, if you're not with us, Pantheon has a solution. Some of the other hosts do. I, I, I love to speak for names of what all the hosts are, but there's so many hosts these days. All of us seem to be working on similar tools. Check with your host and see what they have. Maybe you just have a script to do this. If you work for a university, I, I worked for University of Florida last, where we had two monolithic sites. One of the databases was somewhere around 28 gig. So we had scripts that would allow us to pull that down and run the thing just without too much work. Yeah, otherwise, a, a new developer, that's a two-week process just getting them to copy the database. So it, it, automation comes in really handy on work that we had to write ourselves. We can't go to WP Inch and say, give us a database because it's a university. We hosted it ourselves. So there was a lot of scripts we wrote to do that. But the trick here is at some level, at some level of that initial process, whether it's just the database or just the files, you're looking for something that does a one-click setup that reduces external connections. How many passwords do you need? If you've worked with a client, how many times have you gone back and forth and said, oh, I need this password. Oh, I need the Namecheap password. I need the host password. Oh, you didn't give me this password. I need that now. Three weeks later, maybe you're getting into the site. An idea, these tools reduce that. And hopefully, at the end, reduce your stress level. They're allowing you to develop that site quicker, more efficiently, and without that contact between from the client that makes you feel bad. Oh, I forgot to ask you for this last time. And that's really how the, the modern way that we're dealing with pulling these sites down and setting up our local environments. You can, I mean, my, most folks in here, are still, you still might have MAMP. You, maybe you're using uh, XAMP. Maybe you're using something else. These are all great tools, and there's plenty of ways to automate them as well. But the easiest way is to simply just use your host's tool if they provide it for you. Plugins and themes are a little bit different. 
WP Engine, Pantheon, Flywheel, we don't just go out and say, hey, here's your, host your plugin with us. It doesn't really work like that. You're hosting a website, not a plugin. The simplest way to automate your plugin pull it, pulling, pushing, your plugin development, your ability to clone your plugin locally is simply use the version control built in. If you use Git, you've probably automated a good part of this, this, this step already. How many folks in here use Git or SVN or something like that? So more than half the room. If you're developing a plugin or a theme with Git, that's by far still the most efficient way you probably have to do this type of thing. So when it comes to automation, most folks, are, you already have some of this done. You don't necessarily need to go through all of it. But that's only part of it. Once you get it to the machine, or once you're starting a, a new project, it, it looks a little bit different. We've all seen this type of thing, the Hello World plugin. <laughs> Every tutorial on starting a plugin, most workshops on starting a plugin have some version of how do you get the thing to say, Hello World. Probably don't want to use mine from this example because it's just going to kill WordPress with WP die, but, but it's the same basic example. You, probably, you can find a tutorial out here who's going to give you this and say, this is a plugin. Great. Where does the code go? What kind of code am I building? That hello world is probably, you know, maybe you want to put a version of hello dolly up there. I, I know a lot of folks who have rewritten hello dolly, but that's probably not the end result of what you're going to do. You need to put your code somewhere. What files does that involve? How do you handle all that? What if you need something like SAS or CSS in general, Webpack, Grunt, Gulp, some other tool to help build these assets? Where does all this stuff go? To start a project today, I don't ever recommend just creating a new file. I recommend using code scaffolding. WordPress by default has a great scaffolding system built into WP CLI that allows you to easily reproduce your, your template with every code or theme. It helps you enforce the best practices. So if you're a developer manager or you're simply working with a team of five or six at different skill levels within WordPress, using the scaffolding can help you implement those tools to keep that code at a, at a consistent level across. So one developer isn't developing one type of plugin, you go into another one and it looks like a completely different system you're developing for. Those problems slow teams down quite a bit. They're very opinionated. So you don't have to think about what, what you're doing. Especially with WPCLI, these are written by close to the WP core team. Alan Schlesser, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but one of the leads of that project. There's uh, Daniel Brubaker, another name. I'm sorry, I'm butchering names if you look these folks up. But these are folks who have been working on this project for quite some time and work with the core, core team to allow for, these are the files you need to get started, and here's a whole project spun up. They add your testing automatically. So if you're using something like PHP unit in particular, running uh, WP code scaffold, I'll add PHP unit, just a basic uh, file in there so you can start writing your tests. And all your build tools, grunt, gulp, whatever it might be, depending on which scaffold you use, are already there for you. So things like SAS, you can just run one command after the plugin's set up and you're going to have SAS uh, set up for you. You're going to have JavaScript minification set up for you. And it's a simple command, WP scaffold allows you to build plugins, themes. The themes are based on underscores. If you're using something like Genesis, we're working on something at WP Engine eventually, so you'll be able to do this with Genesis. If you're using something like, uh, I'm trying to think, there's so many theme frameworks out there these days, but most of the major theme rate frameworks either have this already out, or some, some sort of add-on you can do with their own scaffolding. Blocks, so if you're working on Gutenberg and you're trying to develop your first block, rather than just creating a JavaScript file and a PHP file, what do I do with this? You can create a block basic, basic basic block code, excuse me, with just a WP scaffold command. You, if you have an existing plugin and you're putting out versions of it, how many people have pushed out a plugin or theme and found it broke something that they had done six months ago? Yeah, you, new bugs. I crashed 20,000 websites when I launched iTheme Security version 4. It happens. <laughs> I, I admit it. It was a big lesson in testing for me. If, you have, if you've done that, you can start implementing tests, implement unit tests, acceptance tests, things like that. In this case, this will add a basic unit test framework using something called PHP unit. So you can write tests to actually say, if this is your function in PHP, test it. Is the in, if I give it this input, is the output what I expect? So later on, when you do introduce a new feature that maybe modified that a little bit, you're going to know if something broke. You're going to be able to tell if there's what they call a regression. You've broken something somewhere else. Of course, theme tests can do the same thing. 
and it can do a whole lot of more things. It can do things like custom post types, uh, you know, all sorts of different things that the scaffold command can do. You can read the whole thing at uh, the, the WordPress codex, developer.wordpress.org. So there's a whole list in there as well as the syntax to use this. Now the description for this talk was how to get a, a plugin going in one command, and here's that command. WP scaffold plugin, hello world. And the, this list on the right here is all the files this creates. From our install unit tests, th these two files here have to do with unit tests, some ignore files, configuration editors, git ignore, more unit test stuff, Travis, which I'll talk about in a little bit, grunt file, if you're a JavaScript developer and you're panicking on Grunt, there are ways to work around Grunt. I know Grunt is old. It's actually being redeveloped since about June of last year. They've started development again, but Grunt is mostly considered somewhat obsolete since about 2016, but there's ways around that. Of course, your hello world basic file, package.json to get that all installed, more PHP unit, and your basic readme file. Everything you need to get going on a simple plugin. If you're sharing this, if you need build tools, notice this isn't your code. This isn't writing code for you. It's making sure that every developer on your team has the tools to develop this plugin correctly. It's automating that, that basic step. On top of that, it's automating the headers. When you create a new WordPress plugin or theme, how many folks have done that and missed like the title in the right file or in the style.css sheet? You type it wrong, there's a typo in there, and it never shows up in, WordPress, in your WordPress admin. This automates all those little steps for you, all the little things that you shouldn't need to think about every single time you spin up a new project. The theme outline of this, or the theme outlay of this, is very similar to what you have here, just a little bit. Of course, it's going to be a little different files for a theme, and it does a child theme based on underscores. So it's slightly different, but it's all the same concept. It's giving you that same basic template to get started. Of course, if you wanted to add a post type to this, if I wanted to do a movie post type and add it to that plugin, WP scaffold post type movie, label movie, plug it, and it tell it what plugin I want to add it to, and it's going to go add the basic PHP code for a movie post type. Now, it's not going to say a movie post type has title, editor, this option, that option. It's going to give you that code so you can get started. Look at WordPress.org, and then very quickly add the options you need. But it's going to put the code where it should be. It's going to, you know, proper architecture, proper code headers, proper code usage, you know, where do you register a new post type? How does that all work? It's going to help you put all that together to make sure that that, that particular item is there for you. And that can extend to a number, number of other things. So once you create your plugin, start looking at the rest of the scaffold command. Maybe there's parts of it or your theme and see, is there things that I need to use in this plugin or theme that I can scaffold as well? So the scaffolding can actually take multiple steps depending on the needs of what you're building. Of course, these are pretty simple. It's a hello world file, in this case, .php. That's really all the plugin is. If you want to get fancier, for instance, at University of Florida, our plugins had quite an extensive uh, folder hierarchy. When we're building plugins for 40,000 people, there are a number of functions, there are a number of things we want to do right off the bat on every single plugin. This gets a little too opinionated. You know, I said before, the opinionated nature of a scaffolding is its strength, but it can also be its weakness as it doesn't necessarily work for your use case. As I mentioned before, is grunt still a thing? If you're a front-end developer you've, you know, and started in the last year or two, you might not have even heard of grunt. It was huge way back when I was still doing JavaScript. It's been a while. It actually did restart in June. I had to put that disclaimer in there because it's still technically being developed again. But you, maybe that's not what you're using. Maybe you're using Gulp or Webpack or some other technology to, with all your themes that you'd rather do it that way. This isn't, it doesn't create a very complex file structure. It, does, it only uses underscores for the theme. Does everybody in, has anybody in here used underscores? Okay, uh, there's a few, few folks in here. How many folks in here use Genesis? I was hoping for more hands considering that's our product, but there's a few folks in here using Genesis. There's, uh, Thesis is still a thing. There, there, depending on what you're using, that, that might still not fit for you. So, but still, the built-in command only uses underscores. So now you, there's technologies out there that you can write your own. You can write your own P WPCLI command. WPCLI commands don't need WordPress to run. You can stick them on a server somewhere if you're using Vagrant or Docker 
or whatever your technology you're using for your local server, you can build that into your technology and have your own scaffolding command right there. Or you can use something like Yeoman. This first one is uh, actually a fork of the second generator WP. We're I used to work for Tenup many years ago. They did their own scaffolding version with a, a much more complex structure. It still didn't fit when I went to the University of Florida, so I rewrote it and helped convert it over to what we needed. So this adds things like Docker configurations for our local servers. It adds a whole number of things that were very specific to what we needed. You can take a look at, feel free to take a look. The project, my project's actually archived in GitLab because I'm not doing that type of work anymore. But you could use it as a base for maybe that's the type of work you're doing in enterprise. You can roll your own. Golang is a great language for rolling CLI apps if you've never used it. If you're a PHP or JavaScript developer and want to try something completely different, working with multiple return values will drive you nuts for the first three weeks in Golang, but it's a lot of fun. Of course, PHP, JavaScript. Yeoman is actually written mostly in JavaScript. There's various technologies you can use. There's these scaffolding tools. There are, in other words, there are scaffolds for scaffolding, <laughs> and they're used quite a bit. So whatever your need might be, if WPCLI doesn't cut it for you out of the box, take a look at some of these deeper tools. That gets your plugin going. It still doesn't write your code for you. So now we have to watch as we do start writing our code, how do we automate, how do we make sure that that code is the best quality it can be? WP coding standards set the standard for things like code syntax. And there's PHP code sniffer that can enforce this. For instance, it will enforce your code syntax, but it, can, it also enforce best security best practices. It'll tell you, for instance, everybody in here know what a nonce is, has worked with a nonce in a plugin or a theme. It's a number used once. The idea being that if you're, if you're trying to authenticate, say, a widget call or something with Ajax or a JavaScript, you don't want people to be able to just call that thing over and over from different pages from any place. So we use a nonce to say, this, this call is coming from where it should be, for all practical purposes. Coding standards shall tell you when you missed it in a place that you would need it. It'll tell you performance best practices. If you, stick, if you write a query on a, your own query with WP query and tell it negative one on post count, negative one is considered a very bad thing because if you had two million records on a MySQL database and a $3 host, negative one's gonna pull back two million, well, actually it's not gonna pull two million records most likely, it's just gonna crash your server. WP coding standards will flag that for you and tell you, hey, this is bad, figure out how to do it a different way. And it comes with a tool called PHP CBF. Some editors, like Jet, if you use PHP Storm, have their own version of this tool built in. But if you install PHP coding standards on Mac or Linux, you're going to have PHP CBF, which will automatically fix your syntax errors. You can go to a lot of these conferences, and somebody's going to say tabs or spaces or this bracket or that bracket. Who cares? Your project has its own standard. It's PHP CBF. Hook it up with VS Code, hook it up with Atom, hook it up with Sublime Text, whatever you're using, you hit save, code reformats to whatever it needs to be and you move on. Doesn't matter what the, what, if you're using tabs or spaces. More importantly is the developers that you're working with or the people that you need to review your code, it's the same standard that you're, it's a WordPress plugin or a WordPress theme, it follows, X, it follows WordPress standards, they know what they're looking for and what they're looking at. So it's a, it's, it's a much, it's a very quick way to automate the code, it's the development of the code itself. If you're finding bugs, oftentimes we use console.log or vardump. How many people have used console.log or vardump in this, in this room? About half the room, it looks like. There, that's time consuming. You're figuring out where to write it. Oops, I wrote that in the wrong function. Okay, now where do I put it? So you wind up with test one or whatever statement you want to use and test two and you're outputting them in all these spaces trying to find out where you need to debug. You don't need to do that anymore. If you're using a modern text editor, it can already automate this for you in, this, in the case of JavaScript. VS Code, PHP Storm, Web Storm, Atom, Sublime Text, all have tools, all have extensions built in that when you click a line, you can click a line at any point in your code in your JavaScript, load that page in your editor, or in your browser, and it'll stop when it hits that line of execution and tells you everything that you see there. For PHP, there's Xdebug, does the same thing. Every variable you, it, PHP knows about at that point, and it tells you every point that linked to your function. So if you're six files deep in a plugin, it'll say, well, it came from index.php to WP settings to this file to that file, and you can see each and every variable at every step of the way. No more manually typing in 
var dump, what is this thing at this point? You just switch your code, your, your breakpoints around, and everything is solved for you. Well, everything's found for you, hopefully. Let's not say everything's solved for you. You can also profile a page this way, too. This is, this is really neat if you're dealing with big sites. You got a 15 second load time on a huge buddy press site. How do you debug that? Tools like New Relic are out there, but they're very expensive. Xdebug has a profile tool that'll automate this for you. It takes a profile of every function, how long it took to call, where it's located, what called it, and it'll spit all that information back out for you. So now, you can, now you've just automated all that performance check testing. You can go back in and see, oh, well, this, fu this function here has this negative one in this WP query that I didn't know about because somebody wrote it three years ago. If I fix this, now look, I'm down from 15 seconds to one second. Hopefully it's that easy for you. It's probably not, but the, the, the idea is similar in whatever bug you're looking for. Xdebug is probably the single best tool I ever found way too late in my career. <laughs> On the JavaScript side, I, I don't do enough JavaScript. I've used the PHP Storm tools quite a bit. They work with Firefox or Chrome. So basically, if you're using a modern tool, you probably have this stuff in there. WP Engine Dev Kit has Xdebug built in. I believe Local by Flywheel does. I know MAMP's newer stuff does. Desktop Server by ServerPress has Xdebug stuff built in. All these tools are built in there, and they're very easy to use once you get started with them. For everything else, then, to, to automate the rest of the code, you use what they call a task runner. Grunt, Gulp, NPM, Webpack, Make. There's all kinds of things that can run tasks for you, from minimizing your JavaScript at the end, handling all your SAS, shrinking your images, creating translation files. All that stuff can be automated quite simply, and most of this is done out of the box. When you do WP Scaffold Plugin, everything in this particular page is done for you, except for maybe shrink images. I can't remember if that's in the basic one now or not. It'll shrink, your, it'll shrink your JS. It'll take care of SAS. It'll take care of your translations. Everything's ready for you. You don't have to worry about these tasks. You don't have to set them up. You don't have to worry about distributing. When you distribute to WordPress.org, it's just there. So what do you think you're doing? Done, uh, when you think you're done writing the code, the next big thing is maybe enforcing some of these standards. They're available to us. That's great. But if we don't actually use, if we want to use Notepad on Windows, or text edit on Mac. Maybe you are using something that doesn't have this built in. There's ways we can automate, or your developers aren't using this. Let's face it, none of us are going to avoid our, our best tooling, right? But if, as we give this to a junior developer, maybe they don't have the tooling to help them with this. How do you enforce this stuff? Just like WordPress, Git offers hooks. In particular, there's a pre-commit hook which can be used to check all of this. PHP Code Sniffer and WordPress code, Coding Standards, that's what we call a linter. You're basically looking for low-hanging fruit. You're looking for the lint in the code, and you're looking to try to remove it. WP Enforcer will enforce that linter before you can commit. So in other words, when you hit commit in your Git repository, it's WP Enforcer by a guy by the name of Steve Grunwell, who's another excellent WordPress developer. It'll look and say, OK, let's run PHP Code Sniffer on all your WordPress, on all your plugin or theme. Hey, you screwed this up. You can't save it and it'll tell you what line you screwed up, what rule you broke, and where to go fix it. So that's, if you're working in a team, the idea here is to make sure that just because you're following standards, make sure your entire team is too. You're enforcing those standards across the, the entire project. So you're not going to wind up with one set of code or one, style or one level of code really from one person and a different level from someone else. You can also use this for build uh, assets if you really want to. If you want to run that grunt, stop, grunt thing as a as a pre-release hook. You can do stuff like that. You can run anything in it you want. Probably wouldn't recommend that. You don't usually want to commit minified code to SAS or to your Git repository. That's when you end up with conflicts. You, know, you commit one side, somebody else commits another one. Git's going to say, hey, when you try to merge this, which, which version do you want? You spend a lot of time trying to solve those. So you, it's probably not something you want to do, but the point is to emphasize that whatever you do need to do at this stage can be checked. Maybe it's running unit tests. Maybe it's running acceptance testing or something else. It's all available to you at this stage if you need to enforce it. What more testing would you even want to run? WP Scaffold gave us PHP unit, but does your code break everyth anything else in WordPress? Has every WordPress developer set up such tools as Code Sniffer? There's a few other ones we can do. The better part usually where we do this is what's in CI CD. This is continu continuous integration 
or continuous develop, uh, delivery deployment. I really can't talk today, my apologies. If, you ha if you're using Git, if you're using GitHub, if you're using GitLab, if you're using Bitbucket, all these have their own tools built in to already handle this, as well as there's things like Circle CI or Jenkins, which can do, they're considered a little bit more powerful and they can be run independent of your Git host. And typically they run three steps, build, test, and deploy. So they're running, they're the, they're, that's, this is the step at which you're building your assets out. If you wanted to take your plugin and put it out to the world, you want your CI, CI CD, your continuous deployment, to say, okay, take all that code, build our assets out, set up for any testing. In other words, prepare it so we can run all those tests. If you're running JavaScript tests and you haven't built your JavaScript, you're not gonna get too far in your testing. So it's gonna run all that for you. And at the end of the build, it should have a package that can be given to the end user. So the idea here is whatever you have in your repository, you build it so that it's, it's, it's ready for, to be sent out. And then you, run the t then you run tests on it. Is it gonna break something else? Run unit, integration, acceptance, or any other testing. Something like WP acceptance, which Tenup re recently released. Basically what it does is it's gonna run simple things for you. Can I still log into WordPress if this plugin's activated or this theme's activated? Can I still do this task? Can I still create a new post? These are, these are acceptance testing that's looking at the functionality of the application as a whole rather than just individual units. What we use at WP Engine for DevKit is something called Jest. If you're running JavaScript or if you're running anything on the CLI, you're building a new WP CLI command. This will run the command for you and create a snapshot. And every time you run those tests, it'll, it'll run that command again and if the snapshot differs, your test fails. So it's making sure that the output from the entire application is what you expect it to be. You can compute PHP or other test coverage, and at this stage, again, if there's any issues in your code, it's gonna fail. It's not gonna go to your users. They're not gonna find the problem. You've probably all seen some level of this. All of these little ones here, this is taken right off of GitHub, are just examples of the different things that you can display using this type of CI, CD. Some, you know, in this case, it's download rates. Oftentimes, you'll see test coverage, or you'll see build passing or build failing. Build failing or build passing is simply are the tests passing or failing. Is the build stage passing or failing? It's just all notifications as to how far along is the code in that repository good. If you go out to GitHub and you want to download X project to try and it's build failing, you know you're probably going to have some problems if you download right from that master branch. All that's built, all that's handled automatically and updated automatically through this CI CD stuff. Once you get that all done though, now we have to deploy our code. I've covered build and test. Deploying's a little bit different. If you're using CI CD, this can do a lot of things for you. Version your project, copy your files, trigger a remote git pull. You know, maybe it goes out to your server if you're running like UF. It would go out to our server and just trigger the git pull. It'll tell the server, hey, we got new code here, run it. Or run some sort of deployment script. On the case of WordPress.org, maybe it can run a script like this. This, Aaron's, this is now Aaron's script. This is actually the last time, the last WordPress plugin I had on WordPress.org is this plugin that Aaron Eaton adopted a couple months ago. This particular deploy.sh script, you don't need to know the SVN and all the stuff that WordPress.org requires that you use to submit a plugin or theme. You run this script, it does it all for you. It checks that your versions match. You know, if you're submitting a plugin, you have readme.txt version, you have to have the plugin header version. If they differ, it never shows up in WordPress.org. This handles all that for you. It's just a single uh, script that'll work really well on Mac or Linux. Checks plugin version, handles WordPress.org, can use for things, but don't use it for first submissions. That's the problem with any of this stuff. Anytime you deploy, your first deployment should probably never be automated. Develop your process first. Every application deploys differently. Whether it's WordPress.org WordPress on your first deployment, they're gonna review it for you. Once you get the review done and they've told you all the things you've done wrong, then switch to something like this. But then this is for new versions. Hey, I had a bug, I need to re release six versions this week. On a big plugin, that can be a three or four hour process if you're done manually, and you're probably gonna miss a step somewhere along the way. If you're using something like this with CI, CD, all your tests, everything's done within just a couple of minutes and it's out there to your users, and you know everything's complete. It's consistent and it's ready. What about change log? Follow, the prog follow your progress with conventional commits. When you make a commit, in this case, fix. Maybe I'm fixing a post type and that's what I fixed. Maybe I'm making a new feature, blocks. There's this conventional commit CLI, the best 
the, the biggest example I see used is actually from AngularJS, which is at conventionalcommits.org. And it tells you how to make your, when you commit on Git, it tells you how to make your commit that this little CLI script can read it. And in the deploy process, it'll look back at your Git repo. So you don't have to, re if you haven't released in six months, what did, you know, you have 50 different things you put in there. What were they all? You want to communicate that to your users. So it's going to look back at your Git history and handle that for you. This is from a couple days ago, our last release of, our last beta release of DevKit internally. All these are is our Git commits. It just puts this, this actual thing together here, including if we do something that's going to break it for our existing users, it'll tell you. You don't have to remember to say, oh yeah, I forgot. I for we forgot to put in a change log that if they install this version, it's going to break X or Y unless they do something else. It handles all that communications for you, which can be extremely handy the more popular your project gets. And it's a simple NPM script. These are a lot of things you can do with this. From deploying, where are you deploying to? From change logs, from tests. One of the things we use the most is one of the old, probably oldest technologies in the Linux open source world. It's something called Make. It's designed to build files in C or another, you know, some of the older languages. In other words, you had X input file, you wanted Y output file. Make was designed to handle that for you. 25 years ago or longer. We use it today as kind of a server-based task runner a lot at WP Engine, and I've used it at other places. It's the, it can build assets, test unit. You can script all these things to handle it the way you need to. For instance, this is our change log script. It looks complex, but the only difference here that we're doing then, if you were to go to the basic con conventional change log tutorial, is we're running it in Docker because we're not really sure sometimes whose computer we're running it at. I develop on Linux. A lot of my coworkers develop on various versions of Mac. Things can differ a little bit if you're not careful, so we run it all through Docker to make sure everything's even more consistent. And that's what this script here is. Just a simple make script. If we say make release change log, it does this all for us. And it's going to do it no matter what computer we're on, no matter what server we're on, everything's consistent. Some pitfalls of this whole process. No matter how much you automate, it's still not solving your problems. It's not writing your code for you. If you need a plugin to integrate Stripe with WooCommerce, I know there's 50 of them out there. It's the quickest example I can come up with. It doesn't know what Stripe is. It's not going to write your Stripe code. If you put a decimal place point in the wrong place and you're charging your users now $5,000 instead of 50 cents, doesn't care. That's a valid number. Automation is not going to solve that for you. And the ROI of automation isn't something that you're going to realize tomorrow. As you start this process, maybe the first thing you want to automate is bringing up a new plugin. Maybe the first thing you want to automate is your WordPress.org plugin or theme deployment to WordPress.org. It's going to take you a couple of hours the first time you do this to set this up right. It's over the months and it's over releases that, that the ROI of this really starts to pay off. But it's still not one size fits all. Every project you do spin up, you probably still need to look at it and say, OK, I can use Scaffold for every one of my projects. But this particular project deploys this way, and this one deploys that way. So we have to do this a little bit differently. Every step of this may be a little bit different depending on what you're doing. So you really do have to spend a little bit of time still at the beginning to make sure that's all correct. And not everything needs automation. Some of this stuff you, you simply might not want to do. If I have one plugin that I'm going to deploy three times for a, a campaign that lasts two weeks, I am not going to spend time writing make files and automating all that process. I'm going to do it manually and be done with it two weeks later and just forget about it until I probably need it again three years and wonder, three years later and wonder what I did with it. But it, it's not for every project. It's not something, I don't want people going home and saying, well, he said I needed to automate everything I do with this. Now start with one step. Maybe it's, depending on where you're at in your own process, maybe it's just adding unit tests to it. Run the scaffold command on your unit tests for theme or plugin and see what you get. Start writing some tests for the, for the low-hanging fruit that you have out there. Every time we release, somebody breaks this, this part of the, my theme or plugin. Write a test for that. So before you release next time, you can test to see if it's been broken on that particular build. That's a great way to start with this type of thing. It, it touches a lot of different areas. That's what I have. There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do this. I'll take some questions here and I will be available in the happiness bar afterwards. Ma'am? Um, do you have any like, tips for JavaScript edits like, that are like, really low code that you can like, revolution slider and then you can custom JavaScript on 
The question is, do I have any tips for JavaScript sites that are running low with heavy plugins such as Revolution Slider? Oftentimes, uh, I tend to stick more to the PHP layer. So what I can give you is starting to look at what functions are there. And I'll use Xdebug to actually see which JavaScript calls back are slow. Because typically, even with JavaScript, it's not the JavaScript running locally on the client's web browser. It's those JavaScript calls back to retrieve all the images and say, Revolution Pro or something else. So maybe it's as simple as in Revolution Pro is saying, well, this page is running 200 images, and they're hiding this one section so we don't see it. But if you use something like Xdebug and watch your, your console to see what calls it's making back, you can quite quickly see, oh, this is where that call back is, be is happening. This is where it's slow, and then start digging deeper from there, typically with like an Xdebug or whatever your step debugger or profiler is. Does that make sense? The, the, the plugin examples, will it, will it work for any type of WordPress? Is that the question? Yeah, like, for example, if I don't want a front, right? Like, if you have a solution. Oh, sure. Like oh, so yeah, if you don't want to do just a standard post type or something that's going to appear in a theme, can you use it for other things? Yes, you can. You can run a plugin to, you know, maybe you're working with GraphQL and you're building something, an addition to GraphQL. You could scaffold a plugin and then use it from there in order to integrate back into GraphQL or Elasticsearch or whatever your technology might be. Sir? Uh, do you have any recommended resources for uh, learning how to use make, like build uh, your projects and other tools? Do I have recommended resources for learning to use make or some of these other tools? Mm -hmm. The best thing I've done and where most of where I got started with this is 10up's GitHub mm -hmm. and some of the bigger WordPress agencies. 10up, automatic, that puts, up, puts things out, Modern Tribe, Web Dev Studios, WP Engine. What did they do on, uh, on a plugin? I'll find a plugin they built or a theme they built and see how they did it. And that's really where I started, especially 10ups code. They're putting out a lot of open source code right now and had some of the most valuable. I mean, I've even used some of their examples throughout. They've had some of the most valuable ones I've seen. Sir? Sure. The question is, uh, he uses, they use WP Engine. What does DevKit offer? Uh, May 30th is our target launch date for a CLI client, which will basically replicate all the functions of like a local by flywheel or MAMP or something like that. Sync a site down, push a site up, uh, Xdebug's built in. We have Midim Proxy, which Midim Proxy is a tool that'll, if you have a social media plugin that posts and you write test posts and your client is Apple and you don't want it to go out to their Twitter account, it'll intercept all of that stuff, uh, intercept emails going out, uh, you know, all, all the basic developer tools. It's a, it's a complete local stack built on Docker that'll initially work on Linux and Mac. GUI to follow before a 1.0. We're starting with a CLI and then we're going to build a GUI on top of it. Any other questions? Sir? Yep. What you would typically replace is you replace instead of WP Scaffold plugin, it would be WP Scaffold my plugin, and then whatever you want to push into it. And you do that simply by writing a new WP CLI command. The nice thing about WP CLI is if you, if you, if you look at WordPress.tv, I actually have a talk I give completely on writing new WP CLI commands. But it's, it's, it's a fairly simple plugin that you can write and store in various places to be able to handle that for you rather quickly. Any other questions? Ma'am? Can the scaffolding handle where in the WordPress admin the plugin appears? Yes and no. The default scaffolding, nothing appears at all other than it'll appear in, can I activate this plugin? You can hit activate, but there's no code there yet. Perhaps your own scaffold, the, the scaffold we built for uh, UF had quite a bit of settings set up and things like that. So it depends on what scaffolding you're using, but the, the, the base scaffolding does not write any co actual function. So you would implement it yourself. Correct. 
I think we have time for one more. Or not. What's the link for the presentation? I realized I was pressing the button the wrong direction. Sorry about that. WIEG.co slash WCATL19. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I will be in the happiness bar this afternoon for any further questions. <laughs>